Welcome back to Martins and More. My name's Maury Rutsch. And I'm Spoon Phillips. And I'm Mike Dickinson. Hi, He's Mike. In the how you doing? Good morning, Michael. He's in the building. Yay. Michael Dickinson from Martin Guitar. It's going to be a good show. Michael, it's been a while since we've seen you, and shame on us. We, we had the great idea to call this the quarterly report with Mike Dickinson, and we do not do it every quarter. What happened with that? Um, I blame Spoon and Robert Getzel. <laughs> and Robert, because, Robert Getzel? <laughs> you know, nice. Because there's 25 cents in my pocket, Robert Getzel. So... <laughs> Wow, we're Uh-oh. 25 Mike. seconds in and he's spending the Robert Getzel. He's playing the Robert Getzel yeah. card early. This episode's brought to you by our Patreon family. Join our growing community to get early access to every episode, backstage content, and more. Check it out today at patreon.com slash Martins and more. What do you think of that, Mike? I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Always the... Uh, the uh, Provocateur of the understatement. Um, yes. <laughs> so, Michael, uh, remind our listeners, what is your official job title these days at Martin Guitar? My official job title these days is sourcing specialist because I've moved. Um, I do still do wood. When I, you know, back in the days, I was the exotic and wood sourcing specialist now they've trimmed that to sourcing specialist and i've moved into doing stuff like uh other parts and pieces especially a lot of the the pearl that goes on the guitar since you know wood and pearl faces a lot of the same regulations they moved me over to to buy some of that and also you know work with you know if it needs to be bought i will buy it you know it's really important that we say a happy birthday to our friend John Washburn, who was nice enough to send us some questions ahead of time. I got the great idea, great in quotation marks, that we should send our YouTube viewers and our Facebook viewers a little heads up to say, listen, we're going to talk with Michael today. What should we ask him? And uh, I don't know if either one of you guys has this on your computer handy to read it out loud, but one of John's concerns had something to do with uh, now that Martin's making a lot of Martin guitars out of all kinds of wood, like et cetera, et cetera. And one of them, uh, I, I don't know if that was Spoon's email or John's email that said outhouses, but John did say something <laughs> about the crazy places you can actually make things out of wood. Uh, I'm going to go, while you guys are talking to each other, I'm going to try to find that. But first of all, happy birthday, John Washburn. And second happy of all, birthday. Michael, do you know anything about building Martin guitars out of crazy pieces of wood and can we talk about that quickly Re- i think it was reclaimed kind of wood yeah i was going to bring that up yeah the re- reclaimed, reclaimed, wood. reclaimed wood out of um train trellises um we've oh. reclaimed wood you know everybody wow. loves the fact that we um i hate to say this oh oh, oh well remember diaper wood so that was wood that was getting ready to go pulping, and our supplier pulled it out of a pulp mill supply, and somebody jokingly at Martin Guitar <laughs> wrote diaper wood and put it on some brace stock. And as a tour was going by, somebody took a picture of that, and it just swept the internet about uh. 15, 20 years ago. And yeah. So um, we also, a, a lot of logging bridges, um, right now, I'm working with a company in Canada. So there was a, a giant barge that they actually built the sawmill on. So it was a large uh, 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 a barge out of Sitka spruce logs. And then on top of those logs, they built the sawmill, and they would go up and down the river and then you know stop, cut trees down, mill them into wood, lumber and then move to the next spot and then eventually that company went out of business and it became a floating hotel uh, and it was a hotel for like 30 plus years until there was a fire on the barge uh, the buildings that were attached to it burnt down but the barge itself was mostly intact so somebody fished that out of the river and uh, started cutting the logs into guitar tops. Wow. So it was not sinker 
spruce. It was floating it was, spruce. F- yes, floating spruce. Most most spruce is honestly floated. And I will go talk to marketing as soon as we're done and say, that's the new trend. We're going to call it floating spruce tops. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. And I thought Did I remember you guys almost seeing... say floaters versus sinkers, really? <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty sure I'm going to ignore that, and I'm going to mention uh, <laughs> that I remember seeing Stan Jay had ordered a couple of Martin guitars, custom Martin guitars, that I think were even reclaimed Brazilian rosewood from something in Lake Superior or something like that. Does this ring a bell at all to you, Michael? We never received any of that wood so he may have a customs but they weren't from martin so yeah. oh you know i think they were but maybe i'm getting that wrong maybe they were brazilian so rosewood that they th- got custom reclaimed tops on them that may have been what it was but, yeah uh-huh. um there were several people who have tried and failed uh to reclaim wood out of lake superior um and uh, actually most of the great lakes um it, it's just it's very very labor intensive and the wood becomes extremely expensive and there's a lot of waste so that would be a no on the lake superior uh, yeah there would be a no on the lake superior reclamation as for martin guitars we do reclaim wood out of belize in our sinker mahogany which people seem to love Excuse me, guys. I did find the actual uh, quote oh. from John. I wanted to just make sure we covered it the right way. We are talking about John's interest in wanting to know C.F. Martin's reasoning behind sustainability and quality of product. But more importantly, his quote was, they're making guitars from everything, including urban dog bark and last year's Christmas trees, which I didn't know. <laughs> well, I know what yes, he's talking uh, about with the dog bark. Dog bark is a... Uh is a colloquial term for the um, for the eucalyptus uh, that grows in California that was brought over uh, probably even before California was a state or shortly after California was a state. They brought over eucalyptus from Australia, and it's become basically a native species now. Um, have you guys ever looked into that, that urban eucalyptus that they have in Southern California? We let... Uh California trees to the Californians, <laughs> of which there are many. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, we have used some eucalyptus over time. Um, yeah, um, one of my favorite is is a wood called Wandu, which actually is also native to Australia, uh, and and there's been some other woods, but um, nothing. American grown eucalyptus. We we have they're good. Uh, you know, we've had you know walnuts and cherries and maples that are all East Coast woods that we've used. Uh, some of them have been reclaimed. Some of them haven't been reclaimed. You just, you got to be careful when it comes to reclaiming and what you claim when you're claiming reclaimed because you know if i somebody's cutting down you know a hundred thousand acres of natural forest to turn it into a farm uh and was just going to burn it and instead they turn it into lumber you know there there is some greenwashing going on and you just have to be very very careful to make sure you not only buying reclaimed wood but buying responsibly harvested reclaimed wood wow yeah well it's good to know that's that's important to martin anyway if it's not important to everybody out there but yeah um, yeah i know that i know that um um hoover out in california at santa cruz they made some guitars out of barn doors like redwood barn doors stuff like that that they're you know happy to to uh, put online and that sort of thing but Mm -hmm. uh, one of them even had like a bullet hole in it they had to fill that kind of stuff it certainly makes good copy um but you you mentioned you used eucalyptus and those barn doors were redwood i think i remember um manny's 
long ago getting some D28s that had redwood tops. And this would have been in the 90s, probably. Does that uh, well, sound though, accurate? Think, no, though I think that was red cedar. Oh, okay, maybe it was red cedar, because um, I think they would, called it redwood, and I was like, is that redwood or is that cedar? Have. have you guys would, looked into using redwood? Is redwood yeah, a viable the, token? Um, the um, hops and barley had sinker redwood uh, and reclaimed, resalvaged redwood. That was an awesome guitar. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. It's probably still out there for sale somewhere. Um, but just in case somebody wants to use it in 20 questions at some point in time. Um, no, 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 no. It's, it's current models only. So a, a friend of mine right. called me and said, hey, Mike, let's go to lunch. I'm going to be in your area. So I went, okay, sure. And this is right after I had been on think with you guys the first time and we sit down in this restaurant he goes okay 20 questions and i went, <laughs> I went okay you know the rules the rules are has to be a current martin model and i went over you know 10 questions i go through i don't guess the guitar and he tells me the model and he goes no i was thinking ceo six and i went you know, we haven't made that for 15 years, and you just broke the rules. So, you dodged a bullet on that one, Michael. Yes, yes. I'm very so, nervous. Did you see the email that went back and forth about this program, and we were talking about topics, and Michael just really nonchalantly said, we'll do this, we'll do this, 47 questions, and we'll do that. So, we might be changing so the name of it slightly when this guy's on. 47 questions to guess. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of started this whole show kind of loosely. We never really introduced it or whatever. Uh, Michael did mention that he uh, procured wood for a very long time uh, at Martin and still does. Um, and used to, in fact, have a little blog on the Martin website that would mention yes. that kind of stuff, which I wish they would bring back, though. Maybe you're too busy for that now. But um, so by accident, our first question happened to be about uh, reclaim wood, making wood out of making guitars out of wood that was used for other things. Um, but it's a, another big topic at Martin is using uh, domestic hardwoods that uh, that different people have used, but they haven't been used that much at Martin. And most recently, we've had this uh, this GPC exception. Uh, I always say exception. <laughs> GPC inception. <laughs> <laughs> and just recently, we've had this G GPC Inception model that uh, has American maple back and sides, but it's got walnut uh, for the board and bridge and walnut center wedge and all that. So walnut has a long history at Martin. The Nakashima was made with walnut. You've had different models that were made with walnut here and there. Do you really do you remember how far back it was that Martin first is known to start using walnut? And um, what can you tell about the current situation with Walnut and Martin Guitar? I remember in the, I think it was late 70s or early 80s, Dick Boak worked with some college to do a series of guitars made out of American woods. And there weren't many of them made, uh, but there was like, a, I believe they were, you know, this was back in the day when 16 meant experimental. We didn't have a 16 series. So if you ended up with a guitar that said like 516 or D16 or whatever, it was basically, you know, a test model or, or you know, us trying something new. Um, and we did like a D16A for Ash. We did a D16... Um, W for walnut, the D sixteen C for cherry. Yeah, and, so and for mahogany. Yeah, I know. In fact, I yeah. know there's a guy in Pennsylvania somewhere. I can't remember his name who owns all of them. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and I do, and it may be a K Koa, um, but I I definitely saw, I definitely saw, I played an Ash one once at a store when they were still new and for sale, but. Um, yeah, so that's that may so you're saying that may be in the first instance of Martin that's making an official first, one model. Yes. Yeah. That's the first instance I can remember. And then a few years after that we did 
pretty much the same thing, but we did them in the 40 series. So everything had like some pearl inlay rosettes. So when it comes to walnut, you know, I know, I know you, you know, you're, you are pretty uh, even-handed when it comes to wood in terms of your own preferences and stuff, unlike certain people who think that rosewood is definitely <laughs> superior to mahogany. <clears throat> and, um, but, um, so, you know, just in your general opinion, uh, which species of walnut, um, do you have any preferences over your species of walnut for any reason, cosmetically working with them, um, anything like that? Um Cosmetically, Clara walnut from the West Coast is absolutely beautiful and gorgeous. Um, you know, I take a little pride in the fact that most of our walnut these days is coming from Pennsylvania. So the black walnut is, is you know, Pennsylvania made into a Pennsylvania made guitar. So that's pretty cool. That's yeah, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So that tends to be the, the species of walnut in Pennsylvania's black walnut. Yes. And in your opinion, do you think, would you recognize a wal the sound of a walnut dreadnought? Like a walnut sitting at sit a dreadnought, would you like say, that sounds like walnut? No. I, so I grew up in the 80s. We had heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> My ears are shot. You know. no. I, I might be able to say, oh, yeah, that's a guitar. That, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough, fair enough. I believe I can, and I really believe in the inception that that walnut center wedge actually makes a difference in the sound and having it placed like directly behind the sound hole and directly behind the bridge plate. Um, I think it was a very smart thing for them to do to help kind of, I don't know, warm up the sound of uh, maple. But... Um, but yeah, I think walnut's one of those, uh, uh, the Nakashima, if people don't remember the Nakashima guitars, uh, this was actually after Nakashima uh, passed away, the furniture maker that, that for his Japanese name actually lived not far from Martin in Pennsylvania, but they did a project with his widow, and if you've ever been to the picking parlor, those ch the very cool chairs uh, were actually Nakashima designed, and, um, but that Nakashima dreadnought and I think they, they do a small body one to follow up at some point, but that's, I thought, spectacular sounding uh, instrument. And so I'm, I'm definitely a f fan of Walnut. I'm glad to see Martin is, is bringing it back out again. So, so we'll hopefully see some Walnut back and sides coming out soon these new, between the Inception and, the, and these new factory specials and all that. But yeah, is that I a would no say comment probably. look? Probably. That's a no comment look. <laughs> All right, fair the, the, also in that email was what's happening to Martin Guitar in the next hundred years, and you know, so <laughs> I I will predict in the next hundred years you will see more walnut guitars. <laughs> That's my prediction. It's so hard to do because you're going to retire in ninety more years, right? Yes. Well, yeah. that's what before he starts running for uh, Congress with those kind of answers. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of running, I, I have it on good authority that we couldn't do this episode later this week because you're running somewhere else. Are you allowed to tell us what you're doing? Yeah, I'm running to uh, Belize and Guatemala to go you know, search for some mahogany. Well, Belize, Another. expand on that. That sounds exciting. Belize, expand. Oh, cool. I saw, see what you did there. <laughs> Very um, punny. Very yeah. punny. Shut up. Yes. So... Um, Belize probably has some of the best hot sauce if anybody's a hot sauce fan. Ooh, uh, ah. It, you know, besides, it's not just for the heat, it, it's the taste also. Um, so you have to pick some of that up along the way. And, you know, Belize is where we get our sinker mahogany from. And there's also uh, a couple of sawmills in the area that have cut mahogany for us over the years. Um, so we'll go stop, visit, say hello. Um, see what's coming up, see what they think is happening with mahogany in the future, you know, what their supply looks like, you know, um, check out the areas that are regrowing and replanting and see how that's working out. And then we hop over to Guatemala and we do the same thing. Um, several mills I've been to before, we'll go see them. The we also talk about alternative species. Like, I don't know if anybody's seen, uh, we're using a lot of catalysts these days, some granadillo. Uh, we're pulling that out of those countries as well. 
So we'll go look. Just it's it's a lot of it. This time's a fact finding trip just to see what the you know next five to ten years holds for us. Make sure the supply is good. Make sure everybody's following the rules. And Guatemala is amazing when it comes to and and as well as Belize, they're just they're absolutely amazing when it comes to you know FSC and and replanting and you know letting the indigenous people groups of certain areas own the sawmills you know take care of the forest so you know they look at it as definitely a money making opportunity not just for them now but for generations to come so they take care of it and they do a really good thing they do some replanting they do crop rotation they do you know <laughs> everything necessary to make sure that we will have a a good supply of mahogany for you know for as long as as way beyond our lifetime that's, that's really cool. excellent yeah. that's excellent and um and hopefully you'll you know avoid the i don't know if it's mosquito season but maybe it's always mosquito season down there though i don't think so i think in there i think they're there it's only certain times of the year that they have the bad mosquitoes down there yeah it, you would know that more than i given your trips uh, down there I, I am on my anti-malaria medication already, so um, I should be good. <laughs> well, good. Speaking of mahogany and and regrowing and all of that, uh, there was a time when it was a very unusual thing for there to be plantations, like in Peru, mahogany plantations. Now that's commonplace, and there's a big uh, business of taking what is essentially tropical American mahogany and growing it in, in the South uh, Pacific around Asia and maybe in Asia. Can you comment on that? Is, um, have, has Martin actually used like Filipino mahogany that was actually so, the first species? thing, take your hand like this and do this. All right here, let me get that in camera. Here. Bad Todd, bad Todd. <laughs> It is it's not, not plantation. Oh, okay. It is artificially propagated. I see. They don't use the term plantation anymore. Right, because plantation is cornrows. And if you took trees and you just planted one after another after another in rows, but that's not how they do it. Um, oh. In India, in Fiji, um, most of those, are they call it artificially propagated and basically... What that means is you just plant it in and around the natural forest so that it can grow more more like a, a real tree and not like a, a stalk of corn. Like if you go down into the Carolinas where they do a lot of pine uh, plantations, you can stand at one end and look through and see three, four miles of of nothing because the trees are all planted in and same thing in northern just, northern europe they, when they replanted yeah. in belgium and germany and all that that's what you see as well that same kind yeah, of thing. yeah. Oh, wow. we're, we're most of the mahogany has been artificially propagated so there is a difference oh, well that's uh, good i'm glad i never i was never educated on the nomenclature yes. when it comes you know and the and the correct terms like that so so i knew that Artificially propagated. Oh, very good, Mark. Artificially very good. propagated. And uh, yes. So, but that's but what I said otherwise was very ac was accurate. That they are taking the species that had originated in Central and South America and the Caribbean, and they're actually growing that species overseas. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and in, in some places, they did it to have you know regenerate a tropical forest um in other places they did it for decorative woods you know you do landscaping so you plant some mahogany i know that's why while mahogany is technically native to florida uh, most of the mahogany that grows in florida now is you know in people's front yards or along the sides of streets and, and you know um, you know, purely decorative purposes, but so like, yes, I, I was in India, um, I was walking through what the equivalent of a, of a state or national park and mahogany tree after mahogany tree after mahogany tree and walking trails and everything. Um, mm. but, but so they're having mahogany logs we're buying some from there we are looking and have tried 
some Fijian mahogany, which has been in the music industry for you know, probably 50 plus years. So fascinating. Yeah, you will, hmm. I, matter of fact, I, I'm guessing that, um, yeah, there are probably guitars out in the marketplace right now. Now, that does not mean call up Martin Guitar Customer Service and demand to know where your mahogany came from because, you know, it, <laughs> it can't always, I can't say we can't do it, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all mahogany. Way back when you guys made the change from guaranteeing Sitka spruce to being Sitka or Lutz, the first 75 phone calls we received at Mari's Music uh, had to do with customers who recently <laughs> bought something. And their first question was, you, you sold me a, an HD28 about five months ago. Can you tell me, is this Sitka, is this Lutz? And it, it became, if, if not at least just people being curious, some people really wanted to know that if they go ahead and, and take the steps to sell their guitar later, someone's mm -hmm. going to want to ask them what that was. And is that, right. is that something that just ran rampant at Martin, or was it just with certain dealers? Oh, yeah, no, it, it ran rampant at Martin, yeah. Still does. It's, I mean, yeah. it's interesting because when the Lutz first hit the scene in, I don't know how many years ago now, on the West 100. Coast, where, yeah, where people were, were extolling it as this, the, 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 the God spruce that was so much better than anything else out there, yeah. and it was so much better than Engelman or Sitka, and, and, you know, and, and small builder, you know, there was this buzz about it, and now it's kind of, you know, and now all of a sudden with Martin, because Martin didn't use it previously, it's flipped to... To it, when when it took uh, two hundred years or more for a uh, botanist to even recognize it was different from yes. Sitka, it's uh, <laughs> I think we're talking about a pretty close call. <laughs> but however, I have to bring this up, but because I wonder about this with the mahogany that, that when I brought this up, um, it, when you have Adirondack spruce from Northern Ontario and you have Adirondack spruce from South North Carolina to basically get the same sort of proximate grain per inch and all the lines per inch and all that stuff, you're talking about different elevations because the climate's different. And which brings up a question that somebody wrote me when they found out you were going to be on the show of what is European spruce? And so I have my opinions about that, but let's jump over to Europe for a moment. So we all heard about German spruce in the 70s and we heard about um, and we heard about uh, Italian spruce and, you know, with the Stradivarius, and we've heard about Swiss spruce and we've heard about Carpathian spruce and we've even heard about spruce that was smuggled out uh, from behind the Iron Curtain, et cetera, et cetera, back in the day. So, but European spruce is European spruce in the same way that mahogany is mahogany? Yeah, it's all the same genus and species. It just grows in different locations. Um, and there again, you know, can you tell grain structure between mahogany grown in Guatemala and Belize versus Fiji and India? Yes, I, mean, I can, but you know, it's my my job. Um, could most average people? Yeah, I would say no. Um, you know, um, same thing with the spruces. The, I, pretty much there. I, I'm not a botanist. Um, for the most part, when I fill out forms to ship wood, everything coming out of Europe has the same genus and species. Um, and we give it different names based on where we purchase it from. Um, and and that's again, always yeah. been the case. Yeah, so the German yeah. spruce that was on the first D45s made in after the Second World War had German yeah. spruce. That's because you bought them from a German dealer. It didn't mean it was actually cut in down that, in Germany. Yeah, that that's correct. Hmm. Um, and, and the Italian spruce comes from an Italian company, and um, you know we purchased from a, a Romanian company, and so it, it, it's all literally based. Now I, I'm. We do know because we you know part of our due diligence is if we're buying spruce from a German company, one of the things they have to provide is where the logs come from. Um, so, you know, if an Italian company is selling me spruce, chances are they're, they're working only in Italy. And most of these, these are not huge corporations, literally like family-owned businesses that have been handed down. There's, you know, 
mom and dad are in the office, the kids out with the chainsaw cutting down a couple of trees or buying them at a lumber depot or something, you know, like that. So, yeah, we we know where they come from and we name them accordingly. Interesting. Well, one of the one of the reasons I left to that is I, you know, I can hear European spruce compared to Adirondack, compared to England, and compared to Sitka. Um, I was not prepared for how different I thought Carpathian sounded when that Elvis yeah. Presley model came out. It definitely yeah. sounded different than the other European yes. spruce because of the microclimate yeah. that it grew in, the middle content, right. whatever causes that to happen. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> maybe somebody whose ears blew out from listening to heavy metal years ago can't tell the difference. There's never going to be people out there at least can claim they hear the difference between Fijian mahogany and Singaporean mahogany and, you know, whatever. But Yeah. But, um, well, well, back when my ears worked, um, yeah, you, there was something about Carpathian spruce. I, I, I don't know. I guess the name Carpathia, because everybody thinks, ooh, Dracula. Um, <laughs> you know, but I... If I had to pick a European spruce, Carpathian would be the one I like the most because it just seems to have, at least the ones I've played, a better bass response. And as a former bass player, I like woods with, you know, better bass response. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with European or moon spruce or Italian alpine spruce or any of that. Nice, even, mid-range, very loud, very punchy. But, you know, there's an extra boom, boom, boom in Carpathian that you that sometimes even my ears pick up. Which makes it sound more like Adirondack than the other ones in that, at least in the bass response. Yes. That's the way I hear yes. it. You know. Do you guys mind if I bring a different topic to the table or should we go right to 20 questions? No, we, we uh, you can bring another topic, sure, go for it. We talk about humidity a lot and John has found different sources, different videos are telling him different things. To paraphrase his question, He's seen Martin and non-Martin sources recommend 42% humidity, 45, 50. And I think the spirit of his question is how important is relative humidity to Martin guitars? And more importantly, how specifically important is the distinction between 42%, 45%, and 50%? Can you speak to that a little bit, Michael? Yeah, that that's going to end um, with John, like, doing this <laughs> so, no if you can try and keep your guitars between 40 and 50 percent you're good if you go above 50 you can get some swelling if you go below 40 you can get some shrinkage um again just like different woods have different tonal characteristics i mean you can get two pieces of sitka spruce to sound completely different you know two pieces of adirondack that came out of the same tree and they'll sound completely different you can get two pieces of wood on the same model and they will accept humidity and take you know pour out humidity at different rates so you know if you stay in that 40 to 50 percent range and then you know or should I tell him you it has to be forty two point six seven eight? So he like <laughs> bounces it against the wall. Forty two point six seven eight is the optimal humidity for all guitars. Mm -hmm. And if you Except can't do that, yeah. Um, Thank you for most of that answer. Uh, we've everybody's yeah. had things of you know people have had guitars that have suffered from too much humidity or too little humidity, but also a big part of it that too is ch uh, rapid change. So going from very humid to not to very dry or vice versa is also a problem, even if you're even if your top humidity is within the range. Um, right. So well, how do you recommend? Like, <clears throat> let's jump over to gear then because of that. The different humidifiers out there that you can put in the case, or you can put in the body, or you can, uh, you know, I mean, what do you find works? What do you know that people like when it comes to humidity control and uh, you know, that people buy and use? Um, I'm not a fan of the rubber tubes with the holes in it. Um, the damp it? Yeah. What's the other one? It's It's got like a little screw top on it, and you fill water, and it sits between the strings. And I know the owner of the company, and he will. I will get a phone call. Is it Planet Waves? Or I don't remember. No. They They make something like that. 
<clears throat> but maybe it's good that you forgot. Yeah, it's good that I forgot. And and it sits in and then as it's drying out it will shrink. I think that's probably the most user friendly one out there. Hmm. God, I actually have one. I can't remember what it's called either. If it's not Planet Waves, I don't remember now. But um You don't mean the sponge that's made by Kaiser that actually blocks the hole, do you? No, no. No. No, it's the thing, it almost looks like the the uh the bottom of a ship. You know, like the, the um, I can't even think of that word now, but the keel of a ship that sets down in between the strings and um, like in the Do middle of the sound we have time for me hole. to Google? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, but we're talking about this. Um, but, um, and then, the, you know, I mean, also people who go to great lengths to keep a room humidified and uh, like our friend Tony Phillips, you know, lucky enough to have a nice, stable basement. Oasis. He's, it's an oasis. Oh, the oasis. Thank you. No calling. All right. That's not the one I was thinking of, but that's similar. Yes. The oasis is very right. similar. <clears throat> so um, then I'm going to jump to yet another abrupt change, sort of. Um, you were involved in the early research, for Martins in, anyway, into torrefaction. And yes. you actually went to Finland, was it, to, to attend it? Uh, a conference. A yes. conference on that and that sort of thing. So that's been well established that torrefaction is a real deal. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you like how it affects the wood or not, totally. But that it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a true fact that torrefaction, Martin's Vintage Tone System version of it, uh, really does what it says it does. Um, but what about these other tone improvements that have been around for a long time? Uh, before the very first Martin Fest, there was a fellow in the UMGF that swore that if you took this thing that had suction cups on it and you stuck it on it on your top and ran and let it vibrate, um, that it really, really worked. And that was long before the Tone Right and the Tone Traveler. Mm -hmm. Now the Tone Traveler yes. is the latest one. Mm -hmm. um, has Martin actually done much R&D on the, those kind of tone enhancement yes. technologies? Yes, we have. We, we've Every time a new... Uh, a, a new mousetrap is invented, chances are we purchase it and we put it in our sound room and we test it. And I think our, our results on those top vibrating things um, have been the same results that you see anytime you see a review. Yeah, it works for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then once you set your guitar down and walk away for a day, it comes back and it's the same thing. You know, so it it just wakes it up temporarily and then it goes back into normal mode. And of course, when oh, we wow. were little kids, they would say, you, you know, all through the 1960s, you would just stick your, your guitar in front of a, your speakers and blast Jimi Hendrix yeah. for three hours, and it was supposed to have the same effect. Do the same effect, yeah. So you like but, the results, uh, but it's not long-lasting, or it's not permanent? Is that what you mean? It's not, uh, yeah. It's, that's what we found. It's not permanent. Um, and I, like I said, if you go on and you read any reviews for any of those products, usually, you know, five or six reviews down there, somebody goes, yeah, it worked, but it didn't last long. And, and I've read reviews on the unofficial Martin Guitar Forum where they say the same thing. Yeah, it, it works well at first. And then over time, it sort of settles back down to where it, goes it was. goes back to sleep or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Mike. That is really good to hear, especially from you guys, because that's the test where you actually have the sound room, you have the machinery and the data, and you actually spec it out and, and read the results scientifically, where I would have to bet most of the people that did that test on the forums and Facebook have done it by ear. And it's really, at least for me, I, I'd like to say it sounds reassuring that somebody who can really do the, the data and, and get down uh, into the science of it, that's, it's, I find it interesting you didn't find results to the opposite or the contrary, frankly, you know. Huh. Yeah, like I said, and, and it wasn't just us and Facebook and, and online. There's been, like, guitar magazines that have done the same reviews, and, yeah. Hmm. It is what it is. It's pretty, you know. The, you so know ba it basically replaces playing the guitar a lot and waking up yeah. the top. Um, and, and, you know... If you have the time to sit there and hold the vibrating machine onto your guitar top and make it go all over the place, why not just spend that three hours actually playing your guitar? <laughs> not, not everybody uh, gets to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I can see it having benefits for people who are doing recording to just go yeah. ahead and run that thing overnight or whatever before you go into a recording session if you just want to maximize the potential 
I mean, I remember many years ago going into Mandolin Brothers when they had that huge, giant wall of Martin guitars, and the last guitar at the very top in the corner was a 1990 D20, oh, OM28, maybe, and um, the old original OM28s from that era. And it had thick dust on the shoulders, and, um, and it was dead as a doornail. And I took that thing, had never seen one, and I played it for about two hours, and it really woke up. And somebody bought it that same day. And so, so maybe I woke it up and they played it and they liked it. But when you first played it, it, was, it sounded dead as a doornail because somebody had, it hadn't been played for weeks. Um, so there's our next business venture together. We call it The Spoon. Um, you ship your guitar <laughs> to Todd. He will play it for two to three hours, wake it up, improve the tonal qualities of it, and then send it back to you. They have to pay the uh, overnight shipping to take advantage yes. of that. Yes, forty nine ninety nine plus shipping and handling. <laughs> Can I make one demand, one realistic demand? Sure. Certainly. I, I don't like being in, in business with two people. I need three people plus me. Do you know anybody on the board of directors at Martin that would want to get in on this? <laughs> um, I'll ask. Yeah. How about Robert Getzel? Ah, there you go. There's your softball. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. It took me a second, but yes. You almost Robert missed Getzel. It. I did. That was yeah, a I did. That was a high speed softball pitch. I, I should throw you a slow yes. a slow softball. Yes. I think you're up to seventy five cents. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Robert Getzel ah. is now on the board of directors at Martin Guitar, which is good. I'm glad. That's awesome. Made me very happy. I did not you know that. Congratulations. Little... Robert yeah. Congratulations, Robert. And I know yes. a lot of people that watch this podcast and listen to it are not new, but in case somebody doesn't know the joke, can you please explain your your monetary drive between behind what you just did? Oh, <laughs> um, you had interviewed Robert, and I was walking through Martin Guitar, and Robert saw me and told me about the experience, and then I said, hey... I'm getting ready to do it. And he jokingly said, I will pay you a quarter for every time you say my name. So then I show up on the podcast and I start every answer to every question started or had Robert Getzel integrated in it in some way, shape or form. And then um, <laughs> I show up at work one day and there's a check for like $9.75 on my desk. <laughs> And I now have check. that check framed. And it's like, yeah. I, I said, great. Robert, you know, I'm never going to cash this. Ever, ever. This is like, you know, on the day I retire from Martin Guitar, they're going to ask me, you know, what was your greatest moment in time? And I'm going to go, I got $9.75 from Robert Getzel. So, well, yeah. my feelings are a Good little hurt, <clears throat> but there's something else <clears throat> that you have framed by your desk. And I happen to have a copy of it right here. I'm glad you brought it up. I'll be right back. So why don't you show Michael on the screen while I step away and get ah. this thing. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. I think I know, I know what, what it this is. is. Yes, yes <laughs> me too. All right, Michael, while he's gone, get yourself emotionally ready just in case we do force you to play 20 questions okay. after this break. So one of the things that Michael and I bonded over besides uh, Wood when we first met up was The Simpsons. And so for I got him this. I don't remember if it was for birthday or not, but I, I made this for him. Yeah. <clears throat> so here is Mike Dickinson when he was a guest star, uh, guest star on The Simpsons yes. in Moe's <laughs> Tavern. Uh, he, has, he has a slushy there. Squishy. I don't know if you can see, but up in the little corner, there's a picture of Mike Dickinson saying, don't accept checks from this man. From this man. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's so realistic. It's so realistic. On all levels. Martin T-shirt that I made in Photoshop. Yeah, but um, I always get I still get a kick out of that every time I see it. It's kind of like laughing at my own jokes. Um. <laughs> Did they treat you like that at all in Belize and Guatemala, or is that just a stateside thing? Um, it's just a stateside thing. In, in um, yeah, in Belize and Guatemala. Um, I tend to be stick out a little bit, not just being, you know, because uh, I'm I'm a little taller, so I do get um, a little. I, so and it not just there. It's like 
I'll be standing someplace, like just looking at something or, or, you know, trying to, you know, read a menu or something. And all of a sudden they will know people like will stand close to me without saying anything. And then you see the phone comes out and click, 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 click. And they're just trying to get a picture of themselves standing next to the really tall white guy. And <laughs> just, um, I hate when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but she, you know, if they would just say something, I would gladly pose for a picture. But no, it, um, <laughs> I was in India once, and and I just noticed this car kept driving by me and slowing down, and it, I got suspicious. And then another guy at the same time on a bike stopped, got off his bike, and was just standing with his back to me. And another guy from the other side was doing, you know, and they all just kept, you know, getting a little closer, a little closer. And then all of a sudden I noticed the phones come out and they were like doing reverse selfies going click, click. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> God, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. At least we're not that word around you. you know. No, no. Uh, we, we usually have the person stand across the street and take the picture so you yeah. don't notice. Yeah. But, yes. Uh, so they can fit me in the frame. Yeah. Yes. When we do it, you never suspect a thing. So, uh, last night I was watching, um, you had Mr. Gherkin on? We did. Yeah. 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 Um, so, space alien or... He's a cyborg. I mean, is he a cyborg? And, and have you ever seen him play? Yeah, of course. You have to slow down his videos because I'm pretty sure like three extra fingers <laughs> pop out of his hand. <laughs> oh, I know. I believe me. I and, and from what I can tell, and he has he has uh, Peghead Nation, of course. From what I hear, yeah. he surrounds himself with dozens and hundreds of similar people, and that just that makes my my head just explode a little bit. That's the, that's the circles he travels in. Yeah. So um, they're all aliens, or is it just one giant? cult of aliens that just all hangs out together well I, I think it's a lot like you were saying like certain adirondacks growing here and certain's growing there i think Certainly. taya is is from like a part of mars and other people oh. like you know that he's he plays with aren't from the same part of a different solar system uh, but it's kind of like the cone heads yes kind of like exactly. heads when he says i'm from germany mm -hmm. <laughs> germany <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you I, I won't speak for spoon but i was really uh, really kind of starstruck during that episode to talk to somebody that fluid in, in how you can play the guitar and, and play fingerstyle. I think I play fingerstyle guitar when I do my James Taylor stuff, and, and then I see that, yeah. and it's, uh, it's, it's something out of this world. I, I don't feel a lot differently than you than your, uh, your reaction right now. It was, it was pretty awe-inspiring having yeah. you on the show. Yes. Yeah. It reminds me of a Thank story Leo Kotke told when he was uh, Tuck and Patty were open for him um, here at Town Hall, and and he was saying that he first time he saw Tuck play, he had to go up and shake his hand, and while he was shaking his hand, he was like squeezing it to see if there was any bones in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were there? Um, yes, he said. He said that guy's a squid. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you've also both shook uh, Lawrence Tuber's hand. He, there's no bones in that either. Yeah, no, L Lawrence is. Well, right up yeah. there. That's the first thing I think of. Yeah. I mean, Hal Emerson is pretty amazing because he doesn't have very big hands. He's he's got right. pretty. He's got like little gymnasts. But he's got bones. I've shaken his hand. He's got bones in his hand. But, yeah. but Lawrence. Lawrence, also an alien. When I play, uh, I mentioned this before. When I play on a short scale guitar, his I, my version of Strawberry Fields is based on his. And when you get into that thing where the cellos go boom, 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 boom. I have to go, where's the, where's the camera? I have to go, boom, 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 boom. And he just uses his pinky and his finger. And he just, has, he just does five frets on a, on a long, you know, on a long <laughs> scale guitar. It's just, it's just, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's part Unfair. of the reason he is who he is. But yeah, yeah. But, so I have, I have some reader questions. Lee, Lee Kimbrell uh, and uh, over in... Cornwall heard about this, and he wanted. He had two things he wanted to ask. One was about um, the grain width on on spruce tops, and and 
because uh, I remember uh, something, some quote from um, Chris Martin's grandpa about the kind of like grain lines you look for, what they're, you know, between these amounts and these amounts and stuff. But um, can you comment on the difference between tight grain and wide grain? And is there any difference? And, and that's question number one. And the other one is, um, we already kind of covered it when you mentioned ash, but what about uh, the woods that C.F. Martin Sr. built with, including birch, um, those kind of things? Do you guys ever, like, look back into the deep past for the unusual woods and, and any of that? All right, so uh, the first question, grain, grain with, with, yes. In, in um, spruce tops. I do believe... The thinking of Chris Martin's grandfather and great grandfather were sort of polar opposites. At one point, you wanted <laughs> wide grain in the center and tight grain on the edges, and then over time, it switched to you know wide grain on the edges. Um, if you have um, wide grain across an entire top, you know, and by wide I mean like wide i guess we would say anything over eighth of an inch is technically considered wide grain um it, that's like it, it's one of the ingredients in a recipe um mm. so if if you're using wider grain but using thicker braces it may compensate um i i years ago when I was working over at the North Street facility, we had these guitar tops in and you could take them and you could bend them into a circle, you know, that, that far around. And we used those on some tops and, you know, the, that were, you know, they weren't Martin guitars. They were custom, you know, the guitar makers connections. So people were building kits out of them and the guitars yeah. that ended up getting built out of those guitars sounded absolutely amazing. They were loud. Um, you know, you, you, I think Chris Martin always says is you try and build your guitar to the edge of destruction. Um, so you brace it so that you, the top doesn't pull with string tension and, but you don't over brace it so that when you hit a note, the note rings. So I think if, they're in, if you're trying from an aesthetic point of view, you want nice tight grains. If you're going for tone and volume, you want a little bit, wider grain um but a lot of that how that's going to respond in the end is really going to based on all the other parts of the guitar like if you happen to you know lightly brace your top but over brace your back or you put you know a, a giant hunk of wood on for the bridge and you know cover half the top in a pick guard you know those sort of things come into effect too um i love people who you know tone tap tops and they go boom 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 and i get it to 489.7 hertz on the vibration is it yes and then you cut a giant hole in it and then <laughs> you shove pieces of wood ender plastic around that hole and then you glue on other hunks of wood and then you sand it and then you know you glue it to a guitar body and so that whatever hertz range means nothing because you know you, you I, my personal theories is you want to find a piece of wood that's going to vibrate over a wide variety of frequencies because every time you do something to it you are narrowing down where that frequency is going to vibrate so you know and we you know you know we've been in business 190 years i think we figured it out <laughs> um, so when, when people come up and do you tone tap your tops? No, because we've been building guitars consistently the same way for 190 years. And, you know, we've adjusted along the way in the times with, you know, remember the, the Rosewood bridge plate era, cause somebody thought that was a good idea. And then we went back to maple and, you know, it, it is a guitar is a lot of parts, pieces, and a lot of handwork that goes into it to make them sound pretty much as as close as I believe humanly possible can. So you pick up two D28s, they're going to sound within that category of D28, which is going to be different from a D18 or a D18 authentic. So if, if you're Martin, do you? isn't it fair to say you want to not 
tone tap because you, I would think you want all your D28s to reasonably sound very, very similar. And there's almost no impetus to try to get this D28 to ring at a different frequency than something else off the line earlier that day. There, there's, it would almost be a bad idea to have a, a really special D28 in line with all the other ones that we know. Does that make any sense? Yeah. And then you have, let's say, if we build 12 D28s a day, and you put a guy in a room with those 12 D28s and say, hey, play all of these D28s. He's going to grab one and go, this is the greatest D28 ever built. And then you put it back down and you bring the next guy in and say, play them all. He's going to pick out a difference. So even though we build our guitars consistently, but there is some variation, that little bit of variation is good because, you know, people want different things out of their guitars. People hear different things. And that's absolutely true. It would, uh, got, again, back in the old days, Mandolin Brothers playing um, like three D28s, a standard D28, and I felt one was a dog, and I felt the other two were good, and one I liked more than the other, and the dog was the one that sold that day. Yeah. And because somebody else, it had what they wanted, and it was the yeah. guitar that they've been looking for, and they got their D28. I'm sure they were insanely happy they got a real Martin D28. And that's mm -hmm. the one they chose. So very much uh, one man's meat is another man's cupcakes. Um, and uh, so, it, but it sounded like you just said in your limited experiment, accidental experiment with those tops, that the grain was so wide that you could actually f fold the top around so, that it still made really good sounding guitars. Yes. So in other so, words, and oddly grain, enough, the, the grain was not tight. On, the grain was tight on that one. Oh, so it was the opposite. But so it, it was it really was, tight grain. It had grain. tight grain, but it was still the top itself was extremely flexible. Flexible. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So do you feel like there, that grain can be too wide, and is that a structural thing? If grain's too wide? like it's... I, um, do it, Yes, yes. I think grain can be too wide, and is it structural? But everything you build is within your specs of what's allowed yeah, to be. Wide. Everything yeah. is within our specs. Um, just, just from, not so much from the guitar end of things, but from just. I, I also do a bunch of woodworking, and I've just when you deal with softer woods, uh, if the grain's too wide, so so. You're. Without going into the botany area again, yeah, sometimes the wider grain, that little, you have a darker grain line and you have a darker grain line, and in between you have um, the lighter colored grain line. If it's too wide, that's a little too soft. So just from woodworking, if like I've, I've worked with enough pine, which has, you know, fast growing really, you know, if you have a dark line and then some light area when you're sanding, you can actually feel a little bevel in it because the sandpaper will take off. Right? So uh, um, I'm sure sometime we have gone through and found, well, I know we went to um, one of the name brand home improvement stores and resold up. I think it was like a, a two by twelve, and turn that into some guitar tops, and they work perfectly fine. And they had really um, huh. good grain lines. I mean, it's, it's not something I would say you'd want on everything because you know you don't know long term effects. But for somebody buying a Martin guitar off the off a off a rack, no matter how wide the Sitka Adirondack is or how tight it is, it's all well within acceptable specs. You don't have to worry about it one way or the other. Right. Yes, yes. And, and you know, like we said earlier, the worst thing to happen to a guitar is it getting dusty. So don't let your <laughs> guitars get dusty. Dusty guitars, dusty books, bad. Read your books and play your guitars. And if those guitar books are on guitar, even better. You hold it open ah. while you're playing. Play your guitar to your books. <laughs> Do we have time to answer the second part of that question or dive into 20? about the old wood like birch and stuff from cf third so um yeah we use birch now we use birch on our x series next uh, birch from what i know is um i don't know we've used we did a birch guitar 
once I think in our when we were doing the Goodwood series, um, it was an FS certified. Um, so can we go back and look at our history? Yes, but we can't go back too far because it basically started out with us using, you know, cedar, spruce from Europe, ebony, Brazilian rosewood. And then you will occasionally start to find, you know, we have that piece, that one guitar in the museum that was deemed koa, but we think it's actually Goncalo Aves, and there's a fight over that between different scholars. So there's not a lot to choose from until our good friend Dick Boak shows up. And once Dick Boak shows up, then you can look back at our history and see a lot of different woods. Um, we actually did a one-off Alcoa archtop guitar that was amazing. Um, wow. Yeah. And then, you know, you will occasionally find the rare maple or walnut guitar back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but even during the Great Depression, he didn't go with cheaper woods. He just took back some of the stylings on the guitars. Um, mm. So, yeah, so. Well, and you go all the way back to senior, to, to first the F. Martin, some of his early guitars are basically a spruce box with just veneer on the outside of them. Yeah. Isn't that right? Which so. was, I'm assuming, was what was available during the day uh, when he went to the docks that day. Solid wood wasn't available. It was veneer, so he bought veneer and figured it out and glue it to some spruce. Mm. Have you played some of Dick's all spruce guitars? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I was actually... So I, so I played the new ones he just built, but he built some, I, I, I guess, early 90s was the original quote-unquote spruce goose. Um, huh. I, I got a chance to play those, and they had... Unfortunately, they, they were dusty because they had sat... In, in on a shelf for years um and yeah i got to pick them up and play them and you know dead strings and all and, and just you know mentally i think i was preparing myself for a dead sounding guitar and was amazed at how long you know these guitars which haven't been played and had dead strings on them you'd hit and it would just ring and ring and ring and ring do you know if you had a tone right or, a, or something like that on them when you weren't there? <laughs> he may have been sneaking down into the acclimating room and, yes, putting putting tone That's rights on them without telling anybody. You're yes. talking about that, Martin. You're not talking about the new yeah. ones. Yeah, those no, new ones, no. I think they're fabulous. I, they, he has a 12-fret yeah. uh, dread I would love to have that he made out of uh, spruce back sides and top. Yeah. Re really awesome. Um well, guys, it's getting to be that time, and I'm not sure how much we can actually pull Mike away being almost ready to fly to Belize and Guatemala and I don't know where else, maybe New Jersey. Uh, do we have time to play a quick game with you before we let you go? So, yes. We, we may have to edit this so I look good because, you know, I've been watching – uh, on YouTube and like all my coworkers seem to be doing very, very well and getting it like three, <laughs> four, five questions and boom, they guess. So, um, I'm, you've been I'm doing first... very, very well at dodging me. I'll let you know that. Yes, I have been. <laughs> and there's a reason. 20 questions. So this is 20 questions for those who are unfamiliar. One of us thinks up a Martin guitar that's still available for sale among the current models. And the other one has 20 questions in which to guess what model that might be. And they uh, can guess up to three models, but they count as part of those 20 questions. Now, do we subject Mike to guessing or does Mike get to think up a Martin guitar that we have to guess? No, Mike has to guess. Mike needs to redeem himself. Okay, very um, good. Mari, do you want to pick one, or do you want me to? Um, I want you to. Okay. So, I am going to think up a Martin guitar that's available for sale today, and I am thinking of that guitar now, and 20 questions are on the clock. So, first question has to be... Made in Mexico or made in Nazareth? 
needs to be a yes or no question, but I'll say... So you okay. have to pick one of those. <laughs> so, first question. Is it made in Nazareth? Yes. Okay. Is it made with rosewood? N- no. Had to think. Well, you can use rosewood for different things, so yeah. Okay. Do you want me to be more specific? Does it have rosewood no, no, back no. or that sides? No, no, no. That was a legitimate. Okay. That was a legitimate question. That's the right, question. Right. Um. Does it have a long scale length? It does. Yes. Is it a dreadnought? No. Is it in the standard series? No. Does it have a celebrity's name attached to it? No. Does it have a traditional dovetail neck? No. What number am I at? I'm at seven. Okay, so I got You're more. All right. So Don't we'll look start. On your computer. Is it, I had, no, <laughs> too late. I'm cheating. Um, all right. I will stop cheating. I will do this. Is it in the 16 series? No. Is it a street master? No. God. Okay. I already want to quit. Let's let's uh, stop doing this and let me guess. The, um, all right. It's not a standard. It's not a 16. It's not a street master. Um, is it a 17 series? No. That's 10 questions. All right. You still got half your guesses left. You're dancing around. Yes. He's dancing around the... See. I know. He's gonna. He's gonna say, "No, I should have known that." Yeah. Is it a certified wood model? No. Really? Wow. Is it a GP body size? No. I'm wondering how many re- listeners out there are ahead of him or not. I'm on this. probably all of them. They're narrowing. Uh, he's really. You're really narrowing it down, but you're you are you're overlooking some things. That's not a sixteen. Not a seventeen. Not a sixteen. Not a seventeen. Is it a fifteen? It is. Okay. He looks interested again. Is it a? Um, they're both triple O's. What's the skit? Is it a triple O fifteen SM? It is a triple O fifteen SM. Yes. Didn't you? Didn't you just do that one? I did, but you were. Oh. Well, I don't know. The shows aren't always in order of when we record them, but yeah. <laughs> oh. How oh, good. Mike, I'm so okay. happy for you. Like, genuinely, like, thank God he got it right. That's awesome. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> How do you feel? I feel great. I feel Excellent. absolutely Congratulations. wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. We're really going to have to wait until the next time we see you to play that again. But you can go and tell okay. all your friends in Guatemala uh, how good you did. Oh, I will. <laughs> I will definitely let everybody know. But don't look down on them with your superiority. <laughs> no, no, no. I just look down on them because of my height, and they, yeah. <laughs> and they there take their selfies. Yeah. <laughs> it happens to me, yes. Yes, if you're listening to this uh, in Guatemala or in Belize, don't forget to take your mic selfie <laughs> when you see him. Yeah, just, just don't let him know you're Just come up it. and ask. No, no, please come up and ask. It's okay. Oh. Yeah, right. it's fine. Well, Michael, this has been a lot of fun. I want to thank you for your time. I know you're very busy. Spoon, it's always a great time. Did I forget anything else before we let our listeners go? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I wanted to selfishly self-promote that uh, I'm part of an organization that's called the Association of Stringed Instrument Artisans. It was a thing started by Dick Boak in the Ah. 80s. Um, Due to COVID, we haven't been able to have our 
bi-yearly gathering, but we're going to do it down at the Fab Lab in June. So if you check out the Northampton County Community College Fab Lab or guitarmaker.org, you can see the uh, the dates and the listing and the times for the what we call the Asia Symposium. There. Awesome. Self-promoting at its best. That's the best kind, if you ask me. I wish I could be there. Maybe I can. Yeah, come on down. You report live. Hmm, that would be a lot mm. of fun. Yeah. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Michael, thank you so much for your time. From all of us at Martins and More, thanks for listening. Hear you later. Bye.